Welcome to this episode of The Marketing Companion, brought to you by G-Shift and Voices Heard Media. Here are your hosts, Mark Schaefer and Tom Webster. Good day, one and all, and welcome to another edition of The Marketing Companion, broadcasting high atop the beautiful Rockefeller Center in downtown New York. This is Mark Schaefer with my great friend, the gracious and voracious Tom Webster. And rapacious, apparently. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, uh, I just, uh, we, we just celebrated the American holiday of Thanksgiving. And for mm-hmm. our, our British listeners, that's part of the throwing off the yoke of British oppression that ties in with, uh, with, uh, 4th of July. Um, and I was in New York City. I right. spent Thanksgiving. Thanks for, thanks for, for we like to reach more, out. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, we the like votes. to reach out. Thanks for the votes from the UK on that one. Uh, and I, I was in New York City for Thanksgiving. My wife and I took a, a, a bit of a long weekend to New York and had dinner at our favorite restaurant and stayed in a fabulous hotel and just did a grown-up Thanksgiving. And I have to say, I swung by Rockefeller Center uh, expecting to see the Marketing Companion Studios, which I know you have you have charged our uh, our business for. Um, and I, I don't think I saw them. Very – it's unmarked. Very small office. Very, Un- very small. Unmarked. The view okay. is amazing. Like I'm looking at the ice skaters right now. They're having a ball. Let's move on to the next subject. Tom, we got to move on here because we have so many important things to talk about. Today we're going to talk about money. Money, money, money. It's ah. something, something that everybody loves. And we're going to talk about the state of the business as far as content monetization. So we're going to go through a list of kind of where we are with these things. But but first, I kind of had this idea. I think there's the, there's this momentum building, Tom. You know, many people, I mean, I've lost track, honestly, keep referring to this podcast as the Oprah of, we're like the Oprah of marketing podcast. And I'm thinking mm. maybe we should formalize this and have like a relationship segment. Don't, what do you think? I mean, we're kind of naturals at this anyway, right? I don't know if, if naturals is the right word. I think whatever the opposite of naturals is. So, yeah, go on. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, we could talk, you know, we could give people advice about what's going on in their lives and, you know, just take take caller questions, you know, from, from people who listen to us. And so I was thinking, all right, so let, let's start to flesh this out a little bit. What would we call this? What would we call this segment? So I had this name, Are You Through Yet? Are you through that with Mark and Tom? Are you through yet with Mark and Tom? Now, is that are you through yet with Mark and Tom? Or is that are you through yet with Mark and Tom? The power of the comma. <laughs> the comma here is very, very important. Are you through yet with Mark and Tom? Mark and Tom present, are you through yet? Our yes. relationship. Those is. are two different shows. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think I, about it? I uh, So I, I like the idea of people being through with us. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing I thought about was, you know, just – kind of actually playing off of our name, Mark, you know, like a business reason, mm. uh, would be if we called it the Marketing Companion Companions Companion. Mm. Nice, nice. Probably make a good acronym, too. Uh, yeah, I think that's like a Roman yeah. numeral for a million or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, another one that just it's just in my mind for some reason is whoops, there it is. Market top present, whoops, huh. there it is. And we talk about relationships. <laughs> And, and you think that's specifically tied to relationships? Whoops, there it is. Yeah, I not a not be... a subgenre of of relationships. Not something no. more specific than that. No, oh, no, just, no. just whoops, there it is. Yeah, uh, I had well, I had a, a different idea along those lines. I thought about so now what, or <laughs> so now what, so now what, <laughs> comma comma comma. Yeah, so now what, comma chameleon. Is what we could call it. Well, let I think we're on to something. Let's just – maybe we'll get some reader feedback. Let's kind of go with this kind of Oprah of marketing thing. And I didn't give you my best name. Oh, what is it? Sorry. Didn't know. I mean I was well, still stunned f- – I was still reeling from the other one. I know. It's a good, it's a good one, I, okay. and I, I respect that, and I can feel your, your stunnedness. 
Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, sp- specifically about relationships and, uh, and intimacy, which I know we talk a lot about here. On we the do. We do. Yeah. I, I had this idea to call it the weekly minute. The but, what? The weekly minute. But because we're only biweekly, I think it's probably more appropriate to call it the monthly minute. <laughs> the monthly minute. The monthly minute. What do you think? I think we should move on to our topic. Move on. Moving on. All right. Let's talk about money. And, you know, we're going to go through about <clears throat> seven or eight ways <clears throat> that you can make money from your content. Now, look, you can use content for a lot of different things to create a voice of authority, to uh, use it as a customer service thing, to uh, uh, connect and and educate with your customers. But a lot of people out there also want to think about, is there a way to monetize? So we're going to go through every single way we know to monetize content and talk a little bit about what's going on. Is it kind of, you know, going up? Is it kind of going down? Is it something that's on the, on, on moving ahead or something that's falling behind? So the first one, and one of the most popular ways to uh, monetize content is the indirect uh, method. And this is something that Tom and I both use. So the idea here is that we create content And that people read our content, they build relationships with us through our content, and somewhere down the line, they know enough about us to hire us. So is this going up or going down? Well, I think it's it's, uh, about the same, Mm -hmm. I think. I think it's always been successful Mm -hmm. if you truly are a thought leader in your field. Um, I think one of the promises of, let's say, inbound marketing is that you create all this content and people will discover it, then they will find value in you and eventually they will hire you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think the the purveyors of inbound marketing in that sense are correct. But I think what what they don't tell you is the time scale involved in doing this. And that's a super important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Is it a a viable revenue model? Uh, You're damn right it is. Edison does it all the time. But I'll give you just a quick example from our company. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been doing, we've been reporting on research on podcasting for a decade. We started putting out podcast research in 2006. Today, we have podcast clients ranging from NPR to WBEZ and NYC to CBS and Podcast One. It's like a big revenue stream for us, but not it didn't happen except, you know, the last couple of years. Right. So that was six, seven years of laying groundwork. And if you're not prepared for that, then you are not prepared to make money from indirect content marketing. And I want to make a distinction here because I think you and I kind of look at this the same way where we we are both building relationships over time. That's not necessarily what HubSpot does. HubSpot uses content as a source for cold calls, yeah, more or less, or warm warm calls, let's let's say. So they're trying to generate leads, 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 hand it over to a salesperson. I operate the same way you do. I put stuff out there to you know, hopefully develop a connection with people, and it might be three years. People will say, "I've been reading your blog for three years. I've read your books." You're the person I want to hire. Now, I'm not going to say, you said that this is about the same. I'm actually thinking this is a little bit on the decline. It's getting harder. And the reason is because there's so much competition over that content, and it's getting harder to distribute that content in a way that leads people back to us on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or the other channels that we have been accustomed to using. Well, I, I wouldn't disagree with that, I, but I think the ultimate goal of that is not to convert somebody at the end of your content, but it's to be known for something. Mm-hmm. And that's a that's a slower play. It's a longer play, but it's a more lucrative play. Yeah, I agree. And it's, and it's one that I'm committed to. And it's I, I look at this as my primary uh, really uh, mark, marketing activity. Now, another one that you and I have had a really kind of interesting conversation about is subscriptions. Um when do you put up a yep. paywall? So is this now on the rise, on the decline, or what's going on with paywalls? So my here's, here's my gut. I think paywalls are getting better 
I think paywalls are becoming a little bit more lucrative. And the, the model that interests me the most, I mean, there are certain, uh, certain content providers that I, that I pay for and would pay for, right? I pay for the New York Times, you know, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist. The, the model that kind of interests me, and it's one that's done by a lot of local newspapers, but, uh, but some national ones as well, is the X number of free articles. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you what I have discovered. I have discovered in the past couple of months that I am consistently hitting that limit with The Atlantic – Mm-hmm. And I am consistently hitting that limit with the New Yorker. And I think if you find yourself consistently hitting that limit, like mm-hmm. you've had your six free articles this month, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think with the Atlantic, it might be six. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that they have provided at least six articles to me that I desperately want to read mm-hmm. means I, it means I need to pay for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a really smart use of the paywall. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's really a balance. I had a conversation. I did a little consulting uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, with someone in the newspaper business. And they were talking about putting up these paywalls. And, and I said, here's what's going to happen. Once you put up that paywall, people are going to go another place to get their news. They're not, they're going to stop looking at you and they're going to go to the local TV station because they've got an app reporting on the same news as you. And so what I was trying to get them to think about instead was, how do we get our content to move better than the other people? How do we get our content to spread and get people you know, back into a place and hopefully make money off of advertising? Because I think in those cases where there's lots and lots of com- uh, competition for basically commodity-like uh, content, like a news story, that's going to be difficult to, um, to monetize. And I agree with you. I think this is going up a little bit because I think it's things are starting to sort out. I think the businesses that that know how to do it well are doing it well, and and businesses that thought they could do it well are saying no, we got to try something else. So uh, we're we're in agreement with this one. Well, one last thing about that. I think you made the point very well in the content code. Ooh, thank you. That's the content code by Mark W. Schaefer. Um, and that is that uh, it's not so much that it, it, you can't, it's, you have to go more than the content, it has to be igniting the content. Mm-hmm. And when I think about uh, the Atlantic and the New Yorker specifically, is the writing better now than it was a year ago? No, it isn't. Uh, but what it's, it's been equally good both years, but I'm coming across it more often. And there's a variety of so reasons for that. Interesting. One of them is that they're both plugged into Apple News, and I am getting so much of my content through Apple News now on the iOS app, and they're plugged into it. And all of a sudden, I'm halfway through the month, and I've hit up against my limit for uh, for the Atlantic. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's a really interesting dynamic. So um, now here is the traditional method that I think people probably think of most often when they think about monetizing content, and that's advertising. I'm, uh, I'm going to stick affiliate links in there too, because I mean, some people, I guess, can make a little bit of money off of affiliate links. But, uh, you know, I'm talking about banner ads, you know, side ads, something like that. So taking advertising for your site, how's that working out these days? Well, there's there, there's a plus and a minus here. I think the plus is that retargeting has made the the average banner ad more successful. You know, the the fact that you can sign up for an ad service and use retargeting means that uh, on a uh, on a website that may not be buying advertising or selling advertising that is relevant to me can still serve me relevant advertising. I have a higher chance of clicking on a retargeted ad. And I have to say, I've clicked on more Facebook ads in the past year than I did the previous year when I used to rail on them. So retargeting, I think, is helping in that sense. Um, but, you know, in the other in the other hand, you have things like uh, just kind of, you know, text based ads uh, like Google AdWords and things like that. I don't know if those are getting any better or worse. I know that writing in a way that, uh, you know, writing to serve those ads is pretty poor writing. And you can recognize that writing when you see it on the web. It, it does not actually serve the reader. Uh, and I think in that sense, it's, uh, you know, possibly on the decline. But I actually think retargeting is positive. Retargeting is a great innovation, and a very useful innovation. But here's here's why I put a little down signal next to this one. And that is 
online advertising is basically under attack everywhere. The latest numbers I saw that roughly one third of the internet users have some kind of ad blocker. We've got we've got bots that are providing fake click through rates and driving up costs and expenses without any kind of benefit. We've got things like ad injection software where you think you're getting one ad and something kind of places another ad on top of that. And so the, you know, advertising is really honestly on, I think it's in crisis right now that this is the foundational way that most of these online businesses uh, fund their content and make money. And so uh, you know, I'm concerned about where it's all going to where it's all going to end up. Well, I think we've, you know, advertisers have bought that for themselves. They brought it on to themselves, right? I mean, I think the banner ad is one thing, but what is, what, why do we use ad blockers? We use ad blockers because bandwidth and user experience are on the decline. And those, and, you know, bandwidth rates are, in, usage is increasing with advertising. Uh, user experience is on the decline because of all these pop-ups and pop-overs and flyovers and squatters and whatever else you want to call them. Uh, but but they are they're sucking up bandwidth. They're destroying the user experience. And I think if we didn't have so much of those, there wouldn't be so much of a hue and cry for ad blocking. Yeah. Well, you're right. You're absolutely right. Great point. Now, uh, another kind of more popular uh, way to do this these days, we hear a lot about sponsored content. And just to save time, I'm going to roll native advertising into into this too and there's a lot of conversation on the web uh about this so sponsored content thumbs up thumbs down uh a, a provisional conditional thumbs up i think mm -hmm. you know we've always had the advertorial right mm -hmm. if you've ever flown on an airplane and picked up the airline magazine and read the birmingham city of industry city of industry city of industry right we've always had that and, and by the way that's good content it's compelling content um, I think that the sort of naked sponsored post, uh, and you pointed out to me this week that uh, that Harvard Business Review had had a piece of sponsored wow. content like yeah, that. Yeah, I did. Which yeah, I was kind of stunned by. Yeah, uh, that uh, that I'm not so sure about, but I do think there's a middle ground. I think there's a middle ground for someone who has built an audience. And by the way, this is how successful radio DJs and the radio model has worked for decades. Someone who has built an audience who genuinely uses or likes or endorses a product, mentions that product, mentions that they are being paid to endorse it, but convinces the audience that they do in fact use or enjoy it. And so I don't, I don't think there's any problem with that. I think it all comes down to, are you being truthful with your audience or not? Are you being genuine? Can they tell that you do in fact use and endorse this product? And if, if that's all true, then why not get paid for that? But if you see if if that gets sort of seen through by our audience, it's not the fault of the medium. It's not the fault of native advertising per se. It's kind of the fault of the content producer. Have I mentioned this new hair gel that I'm using? Uh, is that is that Brill Cream or is that Miss Breck? Miss Breck, of course. I'm Ms. a Miss. I've always been a Miss Breck man. <laughs> Just thought I I'd put that. a little native advertising in there. <laughs> Ms. Brought Breck. to you by Ms. Breck. Ms. Breck, if you're out there, we'd love to have you as a sponsor for our podcast. You know, this is – I am so conflicted on this whole topic because, number one, I do think that trust is a point of differentiation. And if you turn over your content to an advertiser – where do you cross the line? Where do you cross the line from being a trusted source to looking like a NASCAR jacket with ads all over the place? And there's one, well, there's several case studies actually, where people have really gone aggressively into the sponsored content route and they've lost their audience. One major blogger lost like 90% of his audience in 18 months. And it's it's kind of like this vicious circle because you, you try to monetize your audience and the audience goes, whoa, we don't want this. And then they go down and then your rates go down and are you making money anyway? So um, I think native advertising is being done more cleverly. It's being done quite well in some places. I kind of give that a provisional thumbs up. Sponsored content 
you know, again, we saw this thing on Harvard Business Review, and, and my reaction was, yuck, yuck. That's not what, that's that's damaging your brand. Yeah. So, well, I think it's, it's harder for an institution to do than it is for a person to do. I think a, a, a I person disagree. Can, I disagree. can pull it off. I no, disagree. I don't, it, well, it, it, you're still a brand. A person's trying to build an, a, a trusted audience, too. I think anybody who, you got, anybody's going to take a risk. If they start turning over their content to someone that's paying you to do it, but I don't think I don't think an institution can have brand preferences, but I can have brand preferences, right? Like when I when I make a martini, I make it with Plymouth Gin. Mm -hmm. uh, Harvard Business Review is not going to endorse Plymouth Gin, but I can. Okay, well, okay, that's yeah. Well, I mean, that's not what I define as sponsored content. For example, our we have wonderful. Uh, sponsors of this show, G Shift Voices Heard Media. They have no editorial content on our show. They right. wish they did, <laughs> but they, we just go. We just we just go, and they support us because they believe in us, and we believe in them. What I'm talking about is 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 the blogger who says, you know, someone comes and says, okay. I'm from a luggage company, I'm from Disney, I'm from whatever. We want to place our content on your blog. That's what I think of as yeah. sponsored content. That's and just same with the Harvard Business Review. So that's happening with 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 mommy bloggers everywhere. Even I'm being deluged with offers. So anyway. I want Brought to you by NASCAR, the marketing companion. <laughs> so um Here's a new one. This might be new for our listeners. I'm kind of excited to talk about it because I think it has some interesting potential. Instead of sponsored content, what if people rent your content? That is the business model of a relatively new company called written.com. So I've been working with them for about a year or so. And they came to me and they said, some of our partners are interested in renting old blog posts. And what that means, if someone clicks on that link from whatever source, it, 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 instead of going to my site, it goes to their site for a period of time. And it pays pretty good. I mean, I think it's like a hundred dollars a month per post or something like that. I mean, you can go to dinner on that and there are old posts that really not many people are looking at anyway. And they're business partners that were legitimate companies like Dun and Bradstreet. I thought, you know, let's give it a try. And it's worked out great. So it'll go on for maybe three or four months when they don't want to use that content anymore. They said, we're ending uh, the rental agreement more or less. It's going back to you. Okay, that's cool. But there's some new posts that we're interested in. And it's kind of like I've got 2,000 blog posts. Why not kind of put these dudes to work a little bit? Interesting, interesting model. What do you think? I think, well, it's a model that's fraught with peril. Uh, I think you've done a great job with it. I was fascinated by this when you first told me about it. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, you're in with a good company, right? I mean, Den uh, Dun & Bradstreet, a reputable company. Mm -hmm. When you think about renting something, right? You rent something that is fixed. You know, I rent an apartment. And the, the, the quality of the tenant may vary, but the building is solid. But in the model that you're talking about, you're actually moving to a new building. Right. Mm -hmm. you, like you might be moving from the mall that you're in, uh, in between Neiman Marcus and Barney's. Mm -hmm. And for all you know, your content is being moved to the mall where the, you know, the, the, the pop up calendar stores are and, and the, the Halloween store and the, the old Radio Shack. Uh, it's not the same mall. Right. Uh, and I I think as long as you're comfortable with the people who are renting your content, even though in a, in a way you are their tenant, despite the fact that they're renting from you then it works really, really well. I do think you have to do your due diligence on that, though. Absolutely. I mean, the way I look at it is similar to maybe a guest post, being paid to do a guest post. So if if I would do, a, if Dun & Bradstreet approached me and said, would you want to do a you know a guest post and we'll pay you several hundred dollars to do it, I, you know, it's something I might consider. And uh, so that's kind of the mindset I, I have about this. But it's 
it's, it's an innovative model. And so I just wanted to mention that as um, another option to monetize your uh, content. And we've got one left, I believe, to no. talk about. Well, we, are, we, are we running out of time? We are running out of time, but oh, I know that man. we we want to hit our, our last model here. All right. Well, let me let, let me mention there's we've actually got three left, so let me mention those two and we'll spend a little time on the third. The other one that's kind of obvious is you can repurpose your content into other things that you can sell. Uh, like, you know, books or events. There's a lot of great people out there moving their content into webinars and events. Ian Cleary's doing a great job with this. Kim Garst is doing a great job with this. I think this is going up, up, up. I've also been hearing some rumblings about micropayments coming back. They've never worked. Facebook couldn't make them work. So I say, let's wait and see. The third one that we are going to talk a little bit more about is this idea of patronage. And there's a new site out there called Patreon, where you can put a little button on your site and people can kind of give you tips. They can give you not tips like comments, but tips like money. So if they like your content, they can contribute a certain you know, couple bucks a month. I first saw this, uh, Scott Monty has this on his newsletter, and this is a newsletter I get so much value out of. I thought, you know what? I would love to show appreciation to Scott, I'll give him a couple bucks a month. I thought, well, I'll try it on my blog and see what happens there. So I think uh, I, this is a really intriguing model. It's not a new model, by the way. No. Uh, and in fact, when you, I, I think about one of the, the first, you know, proto bloggers, Jason Kotke at Kotke.org, uh, he left his day job years and years and years ago and launched, uh, relaunched as a full-time blogger on a patronage model. And his blog's been up for 17 years, although he does use uh, advertising now. Uh, and I think there's a couple of ways where this works for you. I think in a lot of ways, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult model to pull off, especially when there is a, uh, a lot of alternatives, right? Mm. But I think there are, there are sort of two ways to go on this. You either do something, uh, and it's in both, both the kinds of strategic moats, you either create a kind of content that nobody else could duplicate easily, right? It would take a lot of work to duplicate mm -hmm. or even duplicate with moderate effort. And mm -hmm. I, I think of a site like there's a site called MBASavant.com uh, where this just statistics nut has aggregated and cross tab every NBA statistic imaginable such that you have actual you have sports casters and, and sports bloggers using his site to put together analytics like it would take somebody a long time to duplicate that he has it he has a, a, an ability for you to donate and people donate to it right that's his strategic mode mm -hmm. and I think the other kind of strategic mode you can have is that you matter to people if you if you produce something that is meaningful if you have some kind of a meaningful connection I mean you and I talked off air about the first thing you think about when you think about patronage is Michelangelo, you think about an artist, right? Uh, and the, the patron to that artist feels a, has a deep connection either to them as a person or to their body of work. And I think you need to have one of those things. You need to have some kind of strategic moat that's difficult to replicate, or you need to have that kind of connection or patronage is not going to work. Well, it, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating thing. And as I mentioned to you, uh, earlier, I'm thinking a lot about it. I'm thinking a lot about the implications. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is half the people who push the button and are donating something to me, I've never heard of them before. We've had no relationship. And as you explore this idea of who are your fans, who are your supporters, who are the people in your alpha audience who have some impact on your business? Who are supporting you and sharing your content to others in ways that you can't see because it's over a text message or an email? So all of a sudden, I'm kind of getting this new group of people blossoming around me. I've created a private Facebook group for these people so that we can kind of get to know each other. And I'm giving them kind of behind the scenes exclusive content every day and they they seem to be loving this so it's an it's a very interesting experiment i mean i don't expect this to be a major um, source of income source of revenue 
Um, but I just thought, what the heck? It is a source of revenue that I've never tried before. Let's do an experiment. And one of the most, one of the unintended uh, or unanticipated, I should say, benefits of this is I'm starting to meet all these amazing new people um, that I had never connected with before. So more more to come on on patronage. Well, I think, you know, don't underestimate the last part of what you just said, and that is that you have also created a velvet rope community for these people. So it's gone kind of beyond just I'm I'm I am uh, I'm a patron of the work that you're creating. It's also I am paying to gain access to something special. Yeah. And they didn't know that when they did it. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. that was not a part of, of, of your of your Patreon, but maybe it will be going forward. Well, it is. I added it because uh, because I'm just having so much fun with it. And uh, the people really seem to be uh, getting into it. And I wish I could be part of that community. But frankly, Mark, you've shut me out. No. You're, you, of course you'll be part of it. I don't even know who you are anymore. I'll, I'll put you on the waiting list. Thank what's hap- what's happened? Thank to you, us, my Tom? friend. Whoop! There it is. It's time for. <laughs> it's time for our sponsors, and this show would not be possible without our our wonderful sponsors, including the fine folks at Voices Heard Media, VoicesHeardMedia.com. Love, 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 Love them. Charter sponsor. They are absolutely uh, integral to bringing you this show every week. And uh, they've got lots of great tools to help you scale social engagement, polls, quizzes, uh, things that you don't. All the things that you you don't want to have to build, just buy from them because they know what they're doing. And our buddies up at G-Shift in the lovely Berg of Barrie in Ontario. I will be going up there again soon. Look forward to seeing all my friends up there. They They are such an amazing group of people. They're kind and they're innovative and they're dedicated and hardworking. And boy, I had the most amazing conversations with them about things that the new things that they're working on new partnerships they're developing and you definitely want to get to know those people check out their website uh just connect with them on linkedin and or send them an email say we we want to see a demo you you will not be disappointed uh really great great people speaking of great people thank you Tom and I appreciate you so much. We appreciate you listening and all the amazing notes that you send us. If you if you think about it, leave a review on iTunes. That would be great. We'd love to see that as well. And until next time, this is Mark Schaefer and Tom Webster signing off. Can't wait to talk to you again soon.